Hello everybody, this is your host Nino and tonight I shall be trying something new, namely a book review and in particular of a work called Exploring Artificial Intelligence on Your Commodore 64 by Tim Hartnell from the year 1985. Now why this and, and generally speaking um, like what stands behind that? Well I can't tell you that when I was a kid, the one thing which really interested me about computers were not, in fact, the games. It was the idea of artificial intelligence already then, although, of course, through a child's eyes, I could not even get any remote grip on, of what that truly means at the time. But that was the thing I was really caring about. And, you know, when you go into retro computing nowadays and look at the machines from back then, Commonly the thing which you are clashing against is the issue of what to watch, what to show, what to try. And the thing which is presently normally shown are games, let's be frank. Like you get a Commodore 64 and then the question is what games could be running on that. Or you get some primitive text editor or even spreadsheet and maybe a couple of lines in basic on the default basic interpreter. But that's it. And for me that's too little. I have never been a fan of nowadays approach of getting, I don't know, extreme resources on a computer, graphic card, gigabytes of RAM, and who knows how many core processor with, at who knows what speeds, and then let it print Hello World in Python or something. So I was much more interested always in getting a weak machine and letting it do marvels. <laughs> and the question is of course, what marvels? Right? What could such a machine typically do at its prime time? And I decided to look at the Commodore 64 because it is a particularly weak machine. And what the Commodore can do, normally everybody else can do as well. And in particular, if you're looking at DOS machines, right? Like you would need just minimal adjustments, but you would have like 10 times the RAM. Yeah, when, when you think of 640k being enough for everybody, you have to keep in mind that's 10 64k segments and that's about 10 normal computers which people could afford back then. So, so it, it isn't too shabby. And I do own a horrible collection of AI books which is really um, everywhere in the house. But... I decided to pick this one as it actually has a rather nice outline of how you could be doing AI at the time. And now I really do intend of going through the entire book. If you're interested in the details, you may try to get it yourself, but at least I hope to give you an idea of what sort of artificial intelligence programs could have been run if you follow the ideas here on your antique computer back then, or on your modern antique computer if you recently bought one or a replica. So without further ado, well, in the beginning it starts with a little bit of an introduction, but it quickly tells you perhaps the most important detail regarding uh, artificial intelligence, namely that in order to learn anything, your program will need to enjoy some form of feedback. Because without feedback, you cannot reason on your deeds, and therefore there isn't really anything that you could be changing or adjusting and or progressing. So in many ways, that would be just a, a program that runs but doesn't improve in any way, and maybe that is not quite what we expect an intelligent program to actually do. It goes on to describe you a little bit what to expect. Yeah, you've got here the chapter about feedback. Uh, <laughs> and then it quickly goes to describe you the basics of Boolean algebra. I do think that it does it in a not too bad way by comparing it to, to a switch and a light and some battery and, and the combination of switches and how these switches, uh, when playing together, can or cannot turn on the light. So, for someone who hasn't ever been dealing with Boolean algebra, this is perhaps not a bad equivalent to, to get a little bit of an idea, you know, you're having basically 
an AND condition, that you need both switches to be on in order the light to be, to be lit. And here you're having an OR condition, either switch will turn on the light. Well, to let a layman who hasn't ever seen anything about Boolean algebra understand how it will be working in general. And it is already showing you truth tables. So, while that is perhaps a bit of a simplification of affairs, it is, I believe, in fact, a very good analogy. <laughs> I couldn't come up with a better one, certainly. <coughs> now, the first thing which we are going to be looking at is a program that is going to be learning to play tic-tac-toe on offs and crosses. This is actually an interesting, uh, an interesting way to start things as despite the fact that it is such a simple game, it already contains all the complexities a major game would be having just on a very, very small scale. And it has been of interest to private computing enthusiasts, if you call it that way, from, from the birth hour of computing. In fact, if you look at a 1960 computer, I believe it is from the year 1960, the MiniVac 601 or the Mini DAC 6010. These, these were computers that you could be like cabling with wires, like, like the mainframes of the 50s. And they were proposed by the computing pioneer Claude Shannon. Then the most complex program these machines could run was in fact a game of tic-tac-toe. And here we are presented with a proposal of making a program which will learn by itself through trial and error which, which positions on a board are valuable and which are not. And, and thereby to learn by winning and losing games how to improve its own play and yeah this is in fact a simplistic but not bad example of an actual artificial intelligence and <laughs> they are referring quite aptly at Arthur Samuel's work of the 1950s and 1960s about the uh, play of checkers, which he was doing on IBM mainframes. So it's interesting when you look at the time frame to say that about some, um, yeah, 20, 30 years later, you could be doing these things at home that could be done at the time on the most powerful and most reasonably affordable computer computers. So yeah, it, it goes on to detail how to how to be playing, like how, how to get the learning algorithm to be running. And it is going on a little bit about uh, rote learning. That is the algorithm when you are trying to remember a certain set of, of history, like some, some steps which happened before that and which, which were marking some moves. And from there to see what each move would be leading to, namely to, to a you know, advantageous or disadvantageous development of the game, and evidently just trying to employ the advantageous ones. So, in this way, uh, this program is combining a limited, uh, limited knowledge base with a limited look-ahead um, exploration of the game space, and then it is improving and, and you know, uh, learning, for instance, here, you see that in the middle of the tic-tac-toe board, that's position five, that it should, if it can, use position five as first position in its move. And in the majority of cases, it is really approaching that and, and starting to understand that starting from the center of the board is a good idea in order to win a tic-tac-toe game. So there are some... You know, some proposals of how you can um, adjust it, a little bit of a uh, program listing, uh, simulated even, simulated human player who is playing particularly bad so that the program can learn how to, how to play tic-tac-toe over the time. And in the end, well, that's pretty much what you would be getting. A program which learns tic-tac-toe not just simply by looking at head and branching, but by learning... Uh, so to say, from observing the outcome of past games, how to improve future play. Now, 
You may laugh that that is of course just tic-tac-toe and that is an extremely simplistic thing and like who cares, right? But even today this approach has a lot of relevance and here I would like to mention in particular the area of self-driving cars. Entire cities are simulated by the big makers of such systems where autonomous cars are driving and are surprised by incidents and accidents and whatnot in order to have them gain experience so that they can be more safely employed on the road under real conditions. So despite the fact that this is just tic-tac-toe and just so simplistic, the basic idea of trying to learn from the past and accumulating experience in order to decide on the future is the basic of artificial intelligence systems till today. You, you have more complex evaluation mechanisms and thousands and cent million folds more data and greatest complexities, but the basic principle, learning from the past in order to act in the future, remains the same. Now the next thing they are showing you is a program that reasons. That essentially is, yeah, they call it syllogy, because it really operates through simplistic syllogisms, that if A is a B and C is an A, therefore C is a B. And <laughs> that's uh, perhaps most classical figure of reasoning already known since antiquity. And in fact, the most typical syllogisms even had specific names. And here they are offering you a very simple program, wh which is, um, you know, do doing that. At the time, that was a very... Um, very widespread use of artificial intelligence. In particular, as far as I'm aware, using the programming language Prolog, on which at the time greatest expectations were directed, and, and therefore to create chains of reasoning that might show conclusions, which in a first look would not be obvious. This is very limited. It is not showing deeper chains of conclusions. It's just showing one syllogism. And the way it, the information is stored is, well, if you're a bit aware of Lisp or IPL4, like these old programming languages, um, which were having property lists, then in a way, the information for the syllogism is stored in a sort of property list, namely in a string, which is then being searched with the midstring function in order to figure out whether you can match, you know, this chain which you would be needing in order to get, you know, from A and B to C. <clears throat> so, this is a little bit, uh, <laughs> this is a little bit continued here, like showing you about a program which, uh, <laughs> which, which can create uh, conclusions on, on eagles and, and flying birds and, and things like that. So, <laughs> Yeah, and, and the sort of conclusions it would be having and, and how it is in fact making this, they call it a matrix, but in reality it's like a table of strings where you're looking like at, at, at each string and trying to find the word in order then to match the third element of the syllogism. So it doesn't go as deep as Prolog would be going, it doesn't have, who knows, what complexities that, that a more serious system might be having. But I do say that for, for a very simple logic program on a microcomputer, that's an excellent idea. Like, I am fond of it. Yeah, here you're seeing the midstring function, where they are trying to be, uh, you know, thereby figuring out um, whether a thing is another thing. You know? <laughs> like that if A is a B and A is a C, that B is a C. So, yeah, that follows with a couple of further examples. And that that's pretty much what there there is to it. It's not not very complex. Now the next the next program they are showing us is called Snickers, and this is one further variant on well search trees and pruning. Basically that when you make a move in a sort of board game, that then you're having the possibility of making further moves. 
and these further moves, however, because there are so many alternatives, lead to something which is commonly known as a combinatorial explosion. And you have then various ways of trying to uh, uh, trying to figure out how to do this. For instance, you can cut off the depth till where you would be exploring each possibility so as to be able to make a move in a reasonable time. And here they are showing you that with, uh, with a simplistic board game of sorts, where, where however they do show you the basic approach in handling that problem. And that is in particular, uh, the minimax algorithm and alpha beta pruning. In essence, that if you are looking at the next step, you do not then continue going deeper and deeper on each level, but that you are just cutting off all trees, which in some level no longer appear as a promising development of the game, and just continue along those branches, which look the most promising from the point of view of each of the players. That is, you assume that if the human shall be playing, he shall not be moving stupidly. And if the machine shall be playing, it shall be uh, also moving in some, well, pretty obviously smart way. And you're therefore cutting away branches which do not appear promising. Because you say that well, playing like an like like a like an idiot is not what is to be assumed as the likely behavior of the players. This simplification assumption has, of course, the downside that a brilliant series of moves, which in the beginning looks extremely disadvantageous, only in order to bite the other player after a couple of moves would not be discovered that way, because you would be cutting it off the moment it starts to look too terribly bad. So, by making such moves, sometimes one can even win better against computer players, because they're not looking at such strategies. They're really looking at what is likely an advantageous move and what not. But this strategy, simplistic as it is, does work in practice pretty nicely. Now, yeah. <laughs> That, that's pretty much uh, the, the way games even work till nowadays. And they are telling you also that you can make things a little bit more complex if you are supplying weights to the, to the algorithm and that you're saying that, for instance, in chess, not everything shall be having the same value, but that uh, some pieces shall be more valuable than others, right? And, well... That, that's pretty much how they do it, and then there are some listings, and then they are showing you yeah, how the program works. But, but in essence, that's how games are pretty much made till nowadays, <laughs> right? Like, there are also some scripted elements and, and something like that, but, but in general, exploring what to do and what to do next is something which has never been lost and which... If you were interested then in it, into it, you could apply that just as well in modern programs. Now, looking a little further, I'm skipping here some, some parts where they're just showing you <laughs> other games and the code listing and whatnot. Yeah, they're telling you that there are also other games like Go and Totello, which particularly quickly spread. Uh, and, and thereby you might be trying, if you're trying to implement some, some game of Go, some very, you know, reduced version of the game that is not having a full Go board, but having some, some smaller variant of it. But that's, that's pretty much what, uh, what is being done in, in games even today. So I must say this chapter I found rather useful. Then you're having a very interesting chapter on language processing. And here they are talking about <laughs> perhaps the two most famous programs of, well, decades past when these things were first done, namely Trudlu, a program of manipulating things in a block word world, and Elisa, which is most well known as a sort of chatbot that plays therapist. Though the therapist session was just one of the things which Elisa could be doing. And I must say, I was rather impressed that uh, this book is proposing a rather nice implementation of the block world. Let me just show it to you. Uh, 
like like that you're having here a couple of blocks and these blocks can then be in some way stacked onto each other so looking at that i must say yeah that's correct that's actually rather interesting regarding natural language processing itself i do really like the way how they said um, like how they approach parsing and basically express that parsing is the transformation of a sentence in such a way that it can be used by the computer and in the past it was mainly approached from a syntactic perspective though of course it was soon discovered that you need a little bit of a uh, little bit in fact very much uh, <laughs> a real world knowledge in order to in order to be able to understand how a sentence should be sensibly subdivided because subdividing a sentence can, in, and in fact, very often is, subject to ambiguities. But it is upon you to decide which of these makes sense in the present circumstances. Like, it's not written in that book, but um, a couple of the famous examples in, in, from a historical perspective are the fruit flies like a banana. Is it the flies which uh, enjoy the banana? Or is it some fruit which, if catapulted, has aerodynamical properties akin to those of a banana and the ballistic flight compatible to it? So, <laughs> uh, you know, or, or the boy saw the girl with a telescope. Now, did he use the instrument to, you know, spy on her? Or was she simply a smart girl with a telescope which the boy happened to just see? And in that sense, um, that the, these basic programs and the necessity of um, employing context and understanding is nicely actually explained in here. Now, what was very interesting in the block world's uh, example in, in original, in the Schrödlu form, which was created by Terry Vinograd, that is not this like sim simplified form, but I think they have here a real photo, is that it was understanding things which you refer to as it, like pick it up and put it on that other object. And Vinograd's program was in fact able to, was able to do that. And here you actually see a photo of the more complex version in which the original Lisp program of Terry Vinograd was um, operating upon. So that at the time was considered uh, a great advance in natural language processing compared to previous systems. Though Vinograd himself was not charmed, you know. Vinograd actually wanted to express that this is very difficult and that his program is doing everything in a very simplified and very streamlined and sort of artificial way with, with a lot of restrictions which are not applicable in real speech. So he was not actually making an advertisement like, look at how simple this is, but he was trying to point out how difficult this is and that he needed a lot of simplifications in order to get something like that running. And till today, there is the so-called Vinograd challenge, which is, you know, trying to, to measure the intelligence of a computer program by letting it, uh, by, by checking how well it is resolving references. For instance, the man could not put the trophy into the suitcase because it was too big. What is it? Well, the trophy. But if it had continued with because it is too small, then what would be too small? Well, the suitcase, right? Though the syntactic structure in both cases is exactly the same, due to real-world knowledge, we, the humans, know uh, which relates to what, but the computer doesn't. And that's extremely common when you are looking at uh, natural language. In fact, I really recommend you to look at some movies and at some of the dialogue, and you will realize how little surface elements human speech really contains. Most of our expressions are highly reduced and very much dependent on previous knowledge. Like recently I watched actually Schindler's List and there was this one scene where Schindler was bribing an official uh, with diamonds in order to leave his Jews alone. And 
The interesting part was that none of what they said made any sense if you do not have world knowledge. For instance, uh, that he put the diamonds on the table. The Nazi says, I could have you arrested. What does that connect? It only connects by saying that bribery is forbidden, uh, but you need to know that. And Schindler answers, in times like these, we need mobile wealth. What is he expressing? He's expressing that, well, that the damn bastards are losing the war. <laughs> and that if they want to run somewhere, they better have something valuable with them. So, <laughs> so you need to know, of course, these details in order to understand any scrap of that dialogue. So it's not such a simple thing of, oh my God, I'll just match the surface to the reference. It's all going to be easy. In fact, it's very difficult. So that, that is what is remarkable about Schrödlu. And the other very famous thing is, of course, Elisa, which I believe everybody knows, <laughs> where, well, Elisa is basically uh, picking up on a word or two of some simplistic composition of words, and then trying to give you a preset response. And when it was created by Weizenbaum, he was pretty shocked how quickly people implanted an illusion of personality into Elisa, how they were trying to treat it as a, as a sort of a really sentient being, although it was a very simplistic program. And Weizenbaum was actually shocked that even people who knew how it was working still were letting themselves willingly be deceived by it. And that is one of the properties of people in general, that we all too quickly try to find something similar to ourselves, even if no such sentience is present in the object. So there is quite some interesting history about that in here, including uh, uh, that, that there were apparently scientists which at the time wanted to use ELISA in some way uh, as, as a real, as a real te therapy device. And if you want to look how sadly that would in fact turn out if you were to try it, there is a very nice movie called THX 1138. It's a, well, by now, retro science fiction from the end of the 1970s, where for counseling purposes, something like Elisa was being used. And you do realize how cold and unfitting that truly would be if, if one tries it. And while Weizenbaum was, was shocked about that, like you see a little bit of, of an example conversation here, right? And while Weizenbaum was shocked about um, such ideas, if you look at things coldly, Elisa is even nowadays used pretty much that way. Like modern chatbots are really working similar to Elisa. That is, you go on some, I don't know, company's website, you look for a thing, it is having preset responses, maybe generated from previous interactions of what to propose to you. Like, I don't know, you're looking for a car. It, it figures out what cars might be something for you. It shows you. Then you're saying, no, you want someone to fix it. Then it is showing you repair options. But the way Elisa is giving you standardized replies, many modern chatbots are giving you standardized replies as well. And while you can employ a lot of machine learning in order to, you know, group keywords, figure out directions of discussion and so on, the basic, the basic um, approach of answer matching keyword uh, combinations is still there. And I believe one of the reasons why it is still there is because it is rather easy to debug and rather easy to understand why a reply has been given to a certain challenge. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that therefore it is not without irony that decades afterwards, <laughs> this, this principle is still used. Not in that same way, but in a not very far away way. And here you see it, it is explaining how it works. It, it is giving you a, like a database of possible replies and explaining to you how you can, you know, construct things and how you can generate replies. So that's a nice tutorial on how to make a chatbot 
which if you would be perhaps extending just a little bit, you could be using today. So that's, that's actually nice. <laughs> I, I did enjoy that. And yeah, then it goes, yeah, <laughs> uh, they have a full code listing at some point. And then it goes into the topic of machine translation. Now, that's a fun topic, because nowadays, of course, in particular with statistical and, and similar methods, also including, you know, neural networks and whatnot, we have greatly improved on the translation front. But it is telling you how it happened classically. And it is demonstrating to you in the end a very simple program where each one word of the one language is, you know, is just simply translated by like into the other language. And it is telling you, of course, the difficulties which translation brings with itself that you do need a lot of world knowledge in order to do that. So this it properly expresses. But, but nonetheless, even at this time, machine translation has been useful in many ways, at least in preparing translations for humans, which then some you know professional translator will look at, but will be able to handle the situation with with such pre-translations much more much more swiftly than having to look up each word himself or herself or like planning everything from zero. And as an example, they give a very famous system actually, Sistran. Sistran was used in the precursor of the European Union, essentially, in order to translate from different languages of the European Union, for instance, from French into English and vice versa, and thereby keep uh, documents in sync, which was necessary for specifications, legislation, and whatnot. So, so while that's imperfect, it is not necessarily impracticable. And... And while that is, of course, a far cry from what is possible nowadays, it was essentially useful. And if I can tell you a little bit from my experience, I read that the primary customer, so to say, the ones most interested in such a system, was the military, because they wanted to know, you know, of course, what other countries are right now writing about, what is, what is in their journals, what's interesting. And you don't need there some very beautiful linguistic translation. You essentially just want to know, are they writing about uranium? Are they writing about plutonium? Are they writing about airplanes? Are they writing about ships, submarines, military strategy? This is the sort of thing you were really looking at. Economic output, raw, raw resources. So that, I believe, even the primitive systems, in fact, could supply. And perhaps a little anecdote, you know, once upon a time, there was such a Israeli linguist, Yehoshua Bar Hillel, of whom I am a very big fan. And Bar Hillel, in the beginning of his career, was actually embracing computer help, but later on became extremely skeptic about it. Essentially arguing that there is way too much hype about it and that machines lack the sufficient knowledge about the outer world in order to ever make uh, who knows how great machine translations. All right, we were momentarily interrupted, but I was telling you about, uh, I guess, Yehoshua Bar Hillel. And the interesting thing which he noted already in the 1950s was that um, the surface of languages does not match. It's not that languages are simply keeping in the same way of expressing things. And a very good example in my eyes is when he said that a red herring is neither a red nor a fish. And he was driving people into such despair that if you ever acquire the proceedings of a symposium called the mechanization of thought processes, there it is really, really funny to, to read how he brought people to despair as he was criticizing a guy so much that their discussion continued across the Q&A sessions of several sub-sessions. You know, like there are several presentations and he so much hurts the feelings of one guy that, that they continue their discussion throughout several of those presentations. Like you can see it in the protocol because they were really recording verbatim what these people were discussing. So that was sort of fun to observe. And here, 
Yeah, here you are getting a little bit of a simplistic system presented, but one which is not unrealistic, and in particular which has not been unrealistic at the time uh, when, when, you know, when you had a C64 in the 80s and wanted to try out these programs. And one system which I only learned about from this book is this one, which is called Franglais, <laughs> which is going to be... Um, going to be very unusual. The idea was that apparently a translation is not entirely undertaken, but only in so far as the system is certain of it. And uncertain words, where the system is not sure how to translate that, are simply left untranslated. <laughs> like, <sighs> Je suis une très exasperated homme. For I am a very exasperated man, because it was apparently not sure what to do with exasperated. <laughs> Here he is given as an example. So that's actually a very interesting approach, which I haven't ever seen quite in any other system, because usually systems try to translate everything, <laughs> whether they can or whether they cannot. Uh, but, but approaches such as this, maybe I should just venture into this briefly, are interesting from a modern perspective, also in light of the EU's uh, recent ideas of uh, regulating artificial intelligence. Because the EU basically doesn't want that systems try to do things that they are not really uh, devised for doing well. And there is outcome which therefore may be dangerous or improper or discriminating or in other ways unacceptable. And if you devise a system which so clearly as this one, um, you know, sets its own limits and respects them, that is actually something which from a regulatory perspective might even be seen as desirable. So if you're like not sure what to do, well then don't do it, then just let the human do it, you know. So yeah, that's Franglais. And then it is showing you, yeah, how to, how to, how to do this, like the program listing. And then another system is presented, Han Shan, where, where apparently they are mixing the Far East a little bit through, w without too much regard for what's Japanese, what's Chinese, named it after some Chinese poet named Han Shan, but is generating things which they believe are similar to Japanese haikus though they are not actually keeping within the 575 syllable form. But what is interesting about this program is that it is not uncreative. Like, it is, in fact, producing interesting results, such as, like, weary, hammered, hanging, and much grieving. Sullen, sullen, I take your poems, poems, man of learning. And, you know... <laughs> Things like that, hanging, twisted, writhed, those that are left. Well, I am very entertained by that. Like here on the left, you apparently have things which can be combined uh, for, for the poems. And then in some random fashions, it is combining sentences. Now, you could compare that a little bit to Elisa except that it doesn't have input. It's like an Elisa without input, you know, it's just generating some text. You can say that if Elisa is an oracle where you talk to it and it replies to you in some mysterious fashion, sometimes plainly ridiculously, this is more like an ancient Sibylle uh, where you don't even say anything and she just gives you some prophecy. <laughs> so that program may be taken as a very good warning in my eyes against our human property of placing too many human-like qualities into inanimate objects and trying to see sense, reason and the soul in immaterial things, like in, in, in things which are actually not at all having such properties. Yeah, and then, with, with a few further nice examples of such, such poems, <laughs> <laughs> bending now at the dusk, hanging in the black darkness, uh, they are showing you a chapter on 
expert systems like um, Tim is, is doing this, Tim Hartnell. Expert systems were sort of the pinnacle of artificial intelligence in the 1970s and 80s. It was like when you were talking about seriously uh, doing things in practice with artificial intelligence, it really oftentimes went into the direction of expert systems, not to say mostly. Now, the view on expert systems presented here is perhaps a little bit, a little bit simplistic, right? But he does mention the core of them quite correctly, namely that the most elementary expert systems can be created by means of if-then chains. Like if some condition is given, then something shall happen. And in many ways, that is a flashback, if you so want, to the beginning of the of the book, where where it was talked about the about about logic gates and about the combination of signals with feedback and and in many ways expert systems if devised through if then chains are very closely following these patterns you're just inputting some sort of information which is being combined in some way and thereupon some sort of decision is being met and some form of output is thereby being created or caused to be created later on and that's what they are telling you here in general. What is interesting is that the that Leibniz is referenced. You know, Leibniz actually had this idea in the 17th century that maybe one day there will be such a development of logic and, and of logical mechanisms that one day disputes will not be uh, handled through through discussions as we have them nowadays, but through the ap application of logical rules. And he, in fact, had this motto, calculemus, like let us calculate, let us compute, in order to settle disputes, uh, like under such circumstances, like from his perspective, once upon, like in one day in, in the future. Now, we know nowadays that Leibniz was wrong in that, in that supposition, because simply whether a thing is the case or not depends on values. These values are non-logical by their very nature. Like, if you talk about justice, for instance, is it just that uh, the strong ones get their way? Or would you rather say that the weak ones should receive some form of support? Well, but that means, evidently, that you're somehow limiting the stronger ones, and so forth. And there, you know, people have always had different viewpoints. That's not something which, um, by chance, hasn't been yet properly specified. It's just something which cannot be specified really well. And that, in the end, nowadays, has been a little bit the downfall of expert systems. Because you are relying on an expertise, on an outcome of recommendations or computations, that may or may not correlate with your underlying valuations. So expert systems can do only so much for you. But still, here it is described how you can sensibly make one. And it is interesting that the historical references are actually pretty good. Like here, for instance, you're having a short mentioning of some of the most famous systems, such as Dendral and Mucin, like Mycene, and, and even Taxman which was an early uh, expert system in the legal area, like for, apply, uh, for applying uh, tax rules. And then, uh, very entertainingly from my perspective, uh, a little expert systems system is given, which is uh, to, to decide whether, <laughs> you know, like whether uh, an animal is a horse, a sparrow, or a man. And expert systems have oftentimes been used for similar tasks like to determine whether there are sometimes or somewhere oil deposits or ore deposits or whether some probe has a certain molecular structure or whether some symptoms fit a particular blood disease, things like that. And this one is deciding between these three beings. And the fun thing is if you, if you sort of look at it, at, at this one, you're seeing a determination that something is a man. And, you know, if, if you had plucked your sparrow, 
yeah, in reference to, to Greek philosophy, then it would be indeed counted as a man, even if you do not cut its uh, toenails. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, that's actually a pretty reasonable demonstration. And then it is giving you a program of how, how you can do that. And here, then it is used uh, such such a like symptom diagnostic on determining whether something is some sort of mineral. And it's generally giving you a rather decent walkthrough of how, how you can have such diagnostic expert systems, which are based on a, um, on on symptoms or criteria or something like that. Also, also for selecting, uh, selecting a microchip, like what, what microchip one is dealing with out of several popular chips of, well, the time when this book was written. And, well, you know, I have been very much interested in expert systems in the past, and I can tell you that's not wrong, but perhaps a little bit simplifying because real expert systems not only did they have all the hell of a lot of roles some of them like at least hundreds but quite certainly sometimes thousands or tens of thousands they had some sort of uh, facilities you know to simulate matching to try several possibilities to tell you that something might be one thing or another thing or perhaps a third and and uh, some of them operated through production rules that these were like elements when you say i don't know if something is is this and this then it like generally changed the rule priorities that and that way so your judgment is a bit different so this is really simplifying matters here but it's not far away from the reality that expert systems were the thing at the time and sometimes used on microcomputers where such degrees of complexity perhaps were not even feasible. And that pretty much concludes this book. The, the further things are like self-learning systems, which is just the same like before the variation of the expert systems, only that this time they are giving here a possibility to, to learn, like to let the system to let the system um, adjust its uh, rule matching according to confirmations by the human whether it guessed correctly or not. Like, like here you see it, like, is this correct? And thereby having an expert system which is not purely preset, but which, uh, yeah, can be changed over time. Now, it's a good question, though, whether you would want an expert system to do that, because if you allow such facilities, then evidently users, perhaps users of limited competency, can change the rules of the system, and then it will not behave in new situations the exactly same way as in previous situations. So for documentation purposes, you might even purposefully omit such facilities. And then, of course, an expert system becomes nothing but a more complex evaluation program, whether a thing is another thing or not. Now, why am I mentioning this in such detail? Again, because of the European Union's AI regulation endeavors of late, I believe there might be a revival of expert systems because expert systems have one particular advantage compared to many other AI systems. Namely, they are greatly explainable or at least greatly more explainable than many other systems in that the system can usually provide you with a rather better overview of how it arrived at a certain output given a certain input. And that the reasoning is not just simply some weights changed it, as in a neural network, or this was just a result out of probability, such as in a Bayesian network, but that you can get a perhaps more easily criticizable uh, chain of conclusions. And that's actually pretty pretty important if you try to justify the results of the system in front of some authority or in front of some user that you can exactly say what it did and why it did it. So I believe that expert systems should not be too forgotten and indeed might find broader use yet again. So then here some self-learning possibilities are shown 
and a little bit things regarding um, learning more than two two possibilities and that's how the book actually ends like it ends here and then you're just having some general advice on, on programming techniques which isn't really of primary interest here so that is this book and I believe that in a very decent way it gives a proper overview certainly a proper overview for a layman and definitely for a layman at the time what artificial intelligence is and what you can be doing with it now if we just very swiftly compare that to something of such proportions you know artificial intelligence a modern approach which has since in many ways become perhaps the standard book on artificial intelligence in modern times. Oh, there are certain things which you won't find there, right? Most popularly, uh, most, most clearly you will not find the popular deep learning things, nor will you find the statistical approaches and so forth. But perhaps, perhaps it is not only the limitation of the computer which makes such things not necessarily suitable for an introductory book for laymen at home. But it might also be the fact that such things then can, can go a little bit into the complex when you try to explain them. Whereas the selection of systems which were presented there was rather nicely fitting that what you can make a, yourself acquainted with in a weekend. So... I hope you enjoyed today's book recension. If you are interested in making uh, experiments with home computers and artificial intelligence, that book is certainly something to have a look at. I might review a couple of others too, because guess what? Of course, this was not the only one, and there was quite an interest in artificial intelligence in, in microcomputers at the time. So, yeah, <laughs> you can experiment with this. And yeah, thanks for watching. Hope to greet you here soon again. Hope you enjoyed that book review. And from me, good evening and goodbye.